Welcome to The Confidence Curve with Ashley and Rick Bowers, where personal and professional journeys define the art of scaling with confidence. Whether you're a business leader navigating change or someone seeking personal growth, this podcast offers insights and actionable advice to help you thrive. Now let's dive into today's conversation with our incredible guest. Welcome to The Confidence Curve. Thank you for being here, Jen. So Rick and I are here today with Jen Folk of TriPoint Connect, and Jen and I have had the opportunity to work together um, in the past for a few years, and we've known each other for a while, and so I'm just so happy that you're here to join us today. Well, thank you so much. I am really appreciative of the invite to join you and looking forward to the things that we uh, we were looking to talk about. Awesome. Well, we're going to jump right in, and if you could tell us a little bit about you and about TriPoint, and what have you been up to in this new journey? Oh, gosh. Well, let's see. I've been in the mortgage business for more than 20 years. And so in that time, I've done a few things, you know, and it's, uh, it's been a great journey. It's been one of those things that nobody ever actually chooses to join the mortgage business. Nobody wakes up one day and says, you know what, I think I want to be a mortgage professional. So a lot of us just land there. And then as you go through the journey, the, the highs and the lows, you find yourself in different positions. So that's been a big piece of my journey has been different parts of the mortgage operations side in particular. And um, in the last year, I've actually been a founding member, I would say founding in the sense of TriPoint Connect is a startup organization. And I've spent the last year growing. And so I'm kind of excited. There's a lot of things you and I did in our past lives together. And some of that comes into the, into the new organization I've been with. But TriPoint Connect is the wholly owned uh, mortgage company that serves TriPoint Homes which is a, a national builder. And we actually do have a presence here in the local Phoenix market. So we've built our fulfillment operations team here locally. And that's a big piece of my passion is building the team. And, you know, just talking to you a couple different times over the last year or so and the growth that you've experienced. So can you kind of talk about that startup and, you know, employee number one versus where you are today within TriPoint and yeah. And maybe share some lessons learned. Obviously, we both have a big history in employee development and hiring. And so it's always great to hear what best practices have you been implementing as you've been growing that team and creating culture inside TriPoint? Yeah, it's funny. I was employee number one in the sense of um, the organization was just fully starting. And I joined in October of last year. So just last week, I celebrated my one-year anniversary. And, you know, we joke around a little bit about it because we thought, one year, you know, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be forever. It's going to take a long time. And you blink, and then the year is over. You know, I started in October of last year. I added a handful of people before the end of last year. But we really focused on creating our core team starting in January. And in the time since, I think I'm up to 75 team members as of now. It's exciting. You know, it doesn't sound like a lot. But when you're trying to add them in rapid succession and you're hiring in batches, you know, you've got... 10 new hires every Monday. And, you know, it's a flurry of activity. It's exciting. Um, building a startup is, it's, for some people, they don't understand, you know, the depth of what you're putting into it. But I've enjoyed, uh, really, it, it's co a combination of adding to the team and a combination of developing the business at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you have to be prepared for the pace of that. And um, you blink and a year is gone already. Lessons learned, right? Obviously, your history with assessments and the coaching and stuff that you do uh, with people. I mean, that's rapid, rapid growth and having to you almost hire in those cohorts, as you mentioned, you know, 10 new people starting on Monday. I'm sure you have some serious questions on that for her. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking too, I was uh, employee number one with TTI back in 1988. So when, when TTI moved to Arizona, it was just father, son that uh, were the founders. And that was the first one that they hired going part-time at ASU. And kind of doing a little bit of everything. So you kind of get that, you understand the business from a whole different level when you're, when you're the first person there. And so it's exciting from that standpoint. I think it's fun that you mentioned being employee number one and wearing many hats. And mm -hmm. that is kind of the key, right? When you're employee number one or five or in, you're in that first dozen, you are wearing a lot of hats at that point because everything hasn't been fully developed. There's not a department to handle that. You are the department. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that the tricky part then is to understand when to take the hat off because you were wearing so many hats for so long, but now you're bringing in all of these people and you're bringing in 10 people a week. And it's like, all right, I need to get rid of this hat. And it's like, who can I delegate to? And that's one of the things that I find a lot with, with clients is that 
they struggle with the delegation because they don't always have the trust levels. And so it's like, how do you build the trust or do you delegate which comes first, the chicken or the egg in that situation? I feel like, did you just look in my notebook? <laughs> I carry this notebook with me. And these are things that I constantly am like exploring and reminding myself and saying, okay, am I doing the right thing? Am I empowering my mm -hmm. team? Am I entrusting, you know, mm -hmm. something to be done? Have I given them a good picture of what yeah. needs to be done? So I just literally, when you said that, I, I, <laughs> I'm going to show you the page yeah. it's written on. All of those things are all written on the same page. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, obviously we use the stages of growth model. We used it, you know, in our past life together and we use it inside Apex. And, you know, stage one is one to 10 employees and, you know, already being up to 75 employees, you know, that's looking at a stage five company, right? It's getting really large and having time in each of those stages is what helps you build a culture and sustain operations and have that foundation and that infrastructure um, so talk to us a little bit about going from stage one to stage five in 12 months. Obviously you have a support of a large organization behind you too, but you really were, you know, spearheading all of that here. And how'd you create a culture that could handle that type of rapid growth? You know, I think we're pretty fortunate because we do have a fantastic parent organization that has a lot of infrastructure already, you know, embedded in it. Right. And so we were able to lean heavily on a lot of that, but also on top of it, I was fortunate enough to staff my core leadership team with some people that I have some history with. And I think there's some value in you're able to ramp up and you hit the ground running a little bit faster and people you have those relationships with. You know, the trust and the proving yourself all over again, that timeline is shorter. So I think that would probably be one thing I would point to, which helped me. You know, I staffed my core leadership team in January and then they also were able to bring in folks that they had from their past. I know that's, I would say that's probably also a byproduct of the market we're in right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't take for granted that the mortgage industry, um, we have our highs, we have our lows, and it's been one of the longer lows. So we've been really fortunate to be able to grab the right people at the right point in time. As far as trying to keep them engaged in culture and those things, you know, that's a daily, it's a daily effort for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's weekly. Those are, there's a lot of things we're still learning and working on together and you know, collaboration is a really big piece of that for us. Uh, that's one of the things that, that I talk a lot with clients about is that transparency and the communication aspects of it. And there, that's a big piece of trust, which is when you think about the five dysfunctions of a team, trust is kind of that baseline. It's like, how do you build the trust and the transparency, the being comfortable having those conversations when you bring in people that you've worked with in the past, you kind of hit the ground running with those people, but then how do you build that trust with the people that you just hired and just met? I'm going to tell you that is a challenge we're continuing to work on. Okay. You know, that is definitely, yeah. we've had a lot of conversations because we all see the vision at our level, right? We're high up and we see the vision and we've bought into it and we're working on it. And we want to think that we're able to cascade the information down and we're doing it regularly. But you can take any survey, any employee survey, and I don't, it doesn't matter what organization you're in, probably the number one piece of feedback you're going to see is we need more communication. Yeah. I'm always like, what does it mean? What? Yeah. Right. And like, please, if you're going to say communication, define it for me. What specifically are you looking for? Because it can mean, it can mean multiple things to one person, much less if you're surveying a hundred people or 300 people or 500 people, you're starting to multiply that complexity of figuring out what does communication mean and what type of communication, what frequency of communication. Um, we talk a lot about push pull, right? And how can we push out the communication three times, but then turn it into something that every employee can pull and, and they have access to so that we can flip that accountability of keeping informed to the employee versus the management team constantly having to make sure, like, did every single person here digest, understand, and are they able to act on whatever it is that we were trying to communicate? Yeah. And then there's the nonverbal communication. <laughs> I mean, you and I are both famous for that as our teams would ask us a question and they would just watch our faces. They didn't even really need to hear the answer because they would get that. And so we, we would call that facial comments as opposed to They weren't always positive. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've seen that once or twice. Yes. We knew exactly how Ashley would respond mm -hmm. to something and you'd look, yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, usually when facial comments are before words come out, it's not a positive reaction. <laughs> That's the hard thing. Yeah. There are there are a ton of books just on learning to read body language, and it's like, how are you? They're like you twisted sideways. Are you straight? Are your hands crossed? I mean, there's just so many things that can indicate 
how the conversation is going to go. And that's a huge part of communication that people don't think about. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one of the biggest challenges is, um, like, for us, we're actually in an office three days a week. And so we have the ability to interact personally, right? But when you're dealing with, we have some folks that are remote. And so when you're dealing with that remote side of things, the communication you're pushing out, you don't always know how they took it. And you don't, can't always tell, you know, the body language because cameras are off or, mm -hmm. or those types of things. And so those are the challenges you continue to face when you're trying to yeah. get the whole team on board and understand, have them understand where you're going with things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah the was... famous, like, they yelled at me, like, did you did you talk to the person? Like, well, no, they sent me an email. Like, okay, well, was it in all caps? Well, no, but just based on the tone, I'm like, was there audio with that email? Like, how, <laughs> like, are we just associating, right? But it's hard, and then we find ourselves doing it too, right? We have to check ourselves. Even though we can teach that and coach that with the people who work with us, we have to then also, how did we take an email? How did we understand like this was my midnight conversation with our teenager last night about his yeah. work environment right now. <laughs> midnight conversations are never good. <laughs> no. So growing up in the assessment world with TTI and, and kind of understanding from the ground up how assessments work and, and how important it is to kind of get that true understanding of an individual, what are some of the, the ways that you utilize to kind of find the uniqueness in the different individuals and so that it, you can do the things like delegate and which roles are they going to be most successful in? Yeah, I mean, we always start with kind of what are their motivators? Where, you know, what excites them? Because if you can understand really where they want to go, like why they're coming in, why they do what they do, then you can think about how you're going to get them where, where you need them to be. And so a lot of our leadership, their, their interactions with their team members are really understanding, like, why, why are you doing what you do? We do a lot. Of, obviously, we have a skill set that we have to have. So we start there and we understand what skills they have. But on top of that, it's important to us that they feel like they have a development path. And so that development could be either personal or professional. And so we've done a few things. We're really trying to encourage our team saying, hey, you know what, we're here for you, but we want you to take these skills and we want to transcend the day-to-day -day of your job. And we want to help improve, for example, relationships at home and with your teenagers and the folks that, you know, um, that you're dealing with outside of here. So for us, we start with how, what, what motivates the person? Like, how do we get them where they're at today? Where do they want to go? And, and what do we play into that? You know, it's just so interesting when you talk about that, that motivation and the driving and that fit, right? And just like kind of the energizers, right? So how do you get them where they just, they want to be in it and, and at it all the time? And I know obviously in our work together, it's really hard drive, going really fast. Um, you know, at a, at a point we were, you know, trying to ready a company for an IPO. During your journey and, and those uh, rapid growth moments, the startup moments, obviously there's a lot of lessons learned. And sometimes when we're in it, um, they aren't really lessons that we want to learn right at that moment, or we're not seeing the value or the benefit that that's going to play out later. It's like looking back, what are some of those lessons learned that maybe while you were experiencing, you're like, what am I doing or why is this happening? But now there's some of the biggest lessons that have really helped you propel your career. And my follow-up to that would be, you know, what advice would you give that emerging leader who's maybe going through some of those lessons right now to keep pushing through? You know, I think, Gosh, where can I start? So many, <laughs> so many lessons learned. Uh, I really think that the main one is, for me, has been we want to be successful, right? And we want to take what we're doing and we want it to uh, be magnified and we want people to see that we've done these things. But it, what's most important is to take what you're doing and to stay focused on what you can control, right? What, what is within your control? And we oftentimes start spiraling because there are things that are outside of what we're working on. And we think that if we can just bring this back in and work on it and control it in our space, then that's going to change what we're working on. And so this is a personal life lesson. I'll tell you what, my mother has been telling me my whole entire life, <laughs> you know what? You cannot work on, you cannot control everything. You need to worry about what is within your control. And so I, I probably practice that on a daily basis. But, you know, the lessons you learn are just, honestly, you, you need to stay focused in what is in this sphere today, and then you can move to what comes next. I mean, I'm a big picture person, and I'm always looking so far in advance. And my problem there is that I'm looking so far in advance, I'm not always seeing, like, what's right here and what is today and what have I just done yesterday. And, and you can't forget those things because that's taking you where you need to go for the next year. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that kind of goes back to the having the right people in the organization, but are they in the right seat within the organization? Can you, from a big picture standpoint, like break it down into the compartments where everybody kind of fits into these different places? I love that you just mentioned that because, um, you know, as we staffed our team, we said, okay, these are the people we need today in these seats. But you know what, who we need today and who we need six months from now and what seats have changed. And so we are constantly reevaluating and we're saying, all right, well, we brought this person in and they've been in the seat. But now we have this growing need for this other area. And are, is there a reshuffle? And that for me is one area I do have to be careful because I'm a very love to move quick. Put me in something new. I get excited by it. Some people need more continuity and they want to stay in a seat a little yeah. bit longer. And as a startup, you know, you may need them to move faster. So, you know, are they in the right seats? Do you have the right people? You know, it's constant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes that goes back to being able to utilize the assessments because you can see from a behavior standpoint, are they very dynamic when it comes to pace? Are they steady when it comes to this? Are they direct when it comes to problems? Are they more reflective? And so you kind of get an understanding of how they prefer to do what they do, which ties into the why they're getting out of bed every morning and coming to work. And so those two simple things tell you so much about the organ or about the individual and how they fit in the organization. It's funny you talk about, you know, control, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us that are really, you know, driven and, and you know, trying to achieve things, Ultimately, like we like to win. And I always think like, does anyone not like to win? Like, I don't know anyone that wakes up and like, how do I lose today? <laughs> right. You know, just in that conversation, I think sometimes we try to control information and the dissemination of information out of fear that, well, if people know this or, um, you know, if I have to talk to them about this, like maybe that'll still redirect them or it might deflate them. How do you decide what information and what really, you know, vulnerable, candid information you share when you're trying to coach people? toward towards that win because I always feel like if someone has a scorecard in front of them they can always know where am I at and having that information even if it's not great information is much more kind someone we used to work with used to always say clear is kind and it really is because people want to know how am I scoring up if I if I don't know if I'm winning like how do I know when I've won right? Like, how do I ever get that satisfaction? So how do you determine what kind of information to disseminate? Yeah, I'm probably um, more on the side of well, I'm not overshare category, right? I really, because I am one of those people that wants to know myself, I tend to want to share and be very clear and be very candid and transparent. Where I draw the line is, again, if it's not something that they have any control over mm -hmm. and they're not going to be able to influence the outcome of it and it's just going to create conflict for them or it's going to create a problem where they, you know, are struggling, that's something I won't you know, necessarily share. And through my career, um, you know, obviously, I've had to um, be a, a holder of information strategic decisions that mortgage companies are making. I'm, we're going to close this particular market. And so knowing that information in advance and then maybe having to not share it, you kind of create this place where you say, okay, if I had to know that information myself in advance and it was going to tear me up, is that the kind of information I should be sharing with people? And so for me, that's where I've kind of created the differentiator. Um, sometimes I'll share the information with them and I'll say to them, I actually, I don't have an answer for this right now. Right? I want you to know about it because it's something that's coming at us or it's something we're working on, but I don't have an answer for you. And again, you have to kind of create the line where you say, if I give this information to them and I don't have an answer, is that also going to create conflict that I then have to manage? And if I can't manage through that, then I just choose not to pass it on until I have more information for them. Yeah, Do sense. you ever give permission for them to ask you questions or, <clears throat> excuse me, to question you? That is such a great question. Yes. And by the way, I love that you mentioned the assessments because um, that is something that has been near and dear to our heart. That is a part of our organization as well as understanding the different styles, characteristics, um, what drives people. But I had a recent example where um, one of my leaders and I have vastly different styles. And my expectation is to be questioned if someone doesn't agree, I want you to challenge me. But based on their style, that's not how they operate, right? And so we kind of kept going back and forth. And I, I just, in my mind, kept saying, why, why are we here? And so we really sat down. We had one of those very, very raw, candid conversations with one another. And, and ultimately, I said, I, I don't want you to be a yes person. I want you to ask. 
And then it became the, I think I need to tell everyone this. So, you know, those are the moments where you, where you, you define and go, okay, I assume you would have known that based on how I think I operate, but you didn't know that. So now I need to change how I operate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just see the light bulbs when you're talking to a leader and is have, have you given them permission to ask the question or to question you? Because everything that comes out of your mouth shouldn't just be taken for granted. I mean, when you really start to question things and have a constructive conversation, that's where the magic actually happens with the, with the team. Or even the expectation to question, right? Not just even permission, I think, you know, and even on certain procedures and things like that, you know, looking at it and saying, okay, hey, you've been following this procedure. Is there a piece of the process that once a month you're saying, hey, does this process still work, right? Is there anything broken in this? Could this be improved in any way and actually make a piece of the process questioning the process or, you know, questioning the individuals and things like that, just in the spirit of always moving the organization along and, and doing the right thing by each other and, you know, building that culture. I think one of the things that we've learned um, through our growth has been that I'm, I'm certainly not afraid to make any decisions and I'll make decisions. I'll make them very quickly. Sometimes I'll make decisions um, one after another, all related to the same topic. And sometimes that causes my team's head to spin a little bit. But what we also have started doing is sitting down and saying like, okay, well, we made that decision at that point in time because that was what we were working with. But as we've evolved, as we've grown, is that still where we need to be? And Again, I say collaboration. That's been a really big word in our organization. And, and um, what we're building is saying, hey, we want to collaborate on how we solve. I am going to tell you, collaboration is phenomenal. But you can't make all your decisions by committee. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think that would probably be the one thing. You know, we started off and I wanted all of my teammates to have the ability to help build. And no pun intended, right? We work for a builder. But we wanted to build something <laughs> really exciting. And then what we found is you get 10 people in a room, they have 10 fabulous ideas. You walk out and say, well, we're going to think about that. And you come back and you still haven't made a decision. Yeah. So it's kind of one of the things that, you know, you, you go, okay, this is one of the things we want to, as a founding operating principle, how we operate, but we can't let that be how all the decisions get made. Right. Yeah. I mean, people really ultimately just want to be heard. Like they have the opportunity to put their ideas out there. They have the opportunity to kind of be part of the discussion, whether their idea is, is accepted or not isn't as big a deal as actually the fact that they got to talk and, and put the idea out there. Yeah, I mean, I think being even transparent about it too, of like, hey, I'm looking for input and information on this, but ultimately I'm going to go back and I'm going to consider all things and I'm going to make a decision or, you know, three of us are going to go back and we're going to come back to you with a decision or like, guys, this is a really open discussion and let's work at it until we get to a decision today, but we're going to get to a decision today, right? And just kind of clarifying, is it, what type of decision process is going to happen. We have a client right now, and they use the saying quite a bit, uh, we need to make the best right decision for right now. I love that. <laughs> right? Because there, there could be three or four right decisions. So what's the best right decision? And it's for right now. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. So what about uh, workplace flexibility? It kind of goes into some of the things that you've been working on. Yeah, I think that uh, our world has changed over the last four years with COVID and, and moving from that majority of organizations were in the office to going outside with having to be remote. Um, and then when is the right time to come back in? I think based on the industry that you're in, you have a lot of people in the office, I understand. Was there a transition for that? Um, only being a year old, you kind of just started from that direction or was there any issue from a culture standpoint? Oh, gosh. This is our every week management topic. So <laughs> I'm so glad we're talking about this. Uh, well, you and every other company right. out there, by the way. <laughs> I, I really am. And, and we do look at the news. We're like, look at what other major organization out there is now calling people back. Yeah. You know, we've worked really hard. And so we did do it from day one because we believe that as you're building this organization and we are all brand new, all of us, it was important for us to be in person together. And there's a lot of value in that, but we are continuing to, um, I'm going to say we're going to continue to fight the tide mm -hmm. because people have said, well, we've been successful working from home. Why should we come to the office? And so, you know, we're looking, we look at ways that they want to come. Like again, what motivates you? So we have some people that have said, you know, I enjoy working from home but I've been wearing pajamas for three years. You know, I look forward to getting dressed on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We do work in the office three days a week. Okay. Um, it's been a challenge. I'm not, I'm really not going to lie. Like commuting 
people that haven't commuted in a long time, and maybe some of them have never actually commuted depending on what their role was. So encouraging them, we do offer flex schedules. So it's like, look, if you, if you leave your house at a certain time and you can get here 15 minutes faster and you want to come in earlier, we allow that. We run, you know, a long shift. And so people can, it's, it's not an entirely like pick your schedule, come in whenever you want, but you know, we run a shift that lets them come in earlier or later based on what works for them. You know, the other thing too, for us that it's like, okay, what are some of the things that people love in an office? Well, spirit week, you know, uh, we feed them a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of that. That happens in the mortgage industry around certain times of the year or the month. You know, it's like, we really need you to stay. So we're bringing lunch in today. <laughs> Some of those things, you know, we've worked on, but it does continue to be uh, one of those things. We talk with our peers. Hey, we're in the office three days a week. What are you guys doing? Oh, we're in the office two days a week, but we're thinking about going to three. It's like, let's stick together on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think that we, um, as a nation, are going to start seeing more of the back in office. And mm -hmm. what will be interesting to see how they implement is those that let their employees move away from the office proximity, mm -hmm. how they're going to handle that. Because you shouldn't be limited to the geography for your talent pool, mm -hmm. but that is what's going to happen. Yeah, I know there's a, a large organization that announced that everyone has basically till January, I think it is, in order to move back where they can be in the office if they've moved away, which even in the housing market and the things that are going on right now, that's not an easy ask, right? right. I mean, it's, sometimes it might be an easier ask than others. The phrase like workplace flexibility, because it was, you know, it's remote, it's hybrid. And I feel like a lot of people are moving towards it's flexible, meaning you know, you're not going to only have to do one day or only have to do two days as a hybrid piece, but maybe we want you in five days a week, but you could come in at nine after you do the kid drop off. Or if you need to leave, like there's just a little bit more flexibility put into that. How is that impacting your applicant flow? Um, we've had a few clients that are hiring people that are in office and they talk about it through the hiring process and everything is set. And then kind of like day, day before start, well... I really need to be out of the office two days a week. And it's like this last minute kind of push to renegotiate, um, which used to be, you know, a sign on bonus or something like that. It's like a renegotiation of which days are in the office. Have you found anything like that? How are you dealing with applicants? Oh, have you been in my meetings lately? It feels <laughs> like I, all the things, look, all the things that you guys are talking about are exactly the challenges that we're facing. Yeah. You know, we, um, we have all of those upfront conversations during the recruiting process. And one of the shifts that we just made is that we really, one of our biggest focus questions is why specifically are you interested in this in-office hybrid job, right? We, what we want to understand from them is more of um, why do you want to be in the office with us three days a week versus is the commute a problem for you? Those were some of the questions we used to ask. We're in the office three days a week. Will the commute be a problem for you? They're going to, of course, say, no, it's not a problem because they're looking to get the job. But to your point, day before, it's like, well, I have a little, I feel like I have a little bargaining power now that I'm supposed to be there tomorrow. Can we make some accommodations? And um, so I think for us, our focus is more on trying to um, get to, to the candidate pool that wants to be in the office. It is a challenge. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge. You know, we have probably had had hundreds of applicants for our positions, and many of them are are not within driving distance. I mean, we've got folks that are in the valley, but not what I would consider really a daily commutable distance. And so you have to really understand, like, is an hour and a half in the car each way something that works for you, for your life, and for your mm -hmm. family, and for your balance? So those are all questions you vet out as you're working through that hiring process. Just talking to a client the other day, and um, they have company vehicles. And the rule around the company vehicle is in Metro Phoenix, right? But what's considered Metro Phoenix has expanded. And so where one employee lives is actually further in mileage than to Prescott. Oh, wow. From the office. But Prescott doesn't qualify for the company vehicle, but the other one does because of how things were labeled, right? So just it, on the communication, on the culture, on the fairness, on the flexibility, it kind of all the ties together. And it's just, you have to be so careful with implementing those types of policies and things because it can have unintended consequences, you know, that maybe aren't exactly what you want. And maybe that would be a high le higher level employee. But years ago, we'd been like, driving from Prescott, why would you do that? But people drive that far every day. 
I actually have to tell you, we've had several applicants from Prescott, Prescott Valley area. And in the conversations with them, they say, we aren't opposed to that commute, mm -hmm. you know, and truly it's actually not that far. It's an hour and 15 minutes. It's, it's probably just as far from Prescott Valley to our office than it is, you know, from the West Valley to our office. So, okay. And they didn't have a hundred days over 110. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think yeah. everyone's been tired of. Kind of continuing on workplace flexibility and just staying nimble. Obviously, being in the mortgage space, I think that's a um, primary element to being successful in mortgage. How have you been responding and kind of giving assurances to people to join the mortgage industry and, and come in during a time where it's not necessarily seen as this great industry? Obviously, with uh, a new home builder, there's a lot of advantages there. You've been able to capitalize on some talent, so it's really worked out in your favor um, but how do you kind of respond to market changes and the ebbs and flows of everything and keep that culture and that spirit really high um, as they, you know, potentially are not hearing great things on the news every day about their space? Yeah, I think I feel really fortunate. Definitely the mortgage industry, we have our peaks and valleys. But when you work for a home builder, we're not immune to the market, but we are a little bit more insulated. So we, I call them the rolling hills. So for us, um, you know, that to me is one of the greatest features of being able to say to a team that wants to stay in the mortgage business, like we have some consistency in our um, overall flow. Uh, but really, when, when you see what's coming in the market, we, we say all the time, okay, it's an election year, and election years tend to do those things. They, they put people on the fence or they have them wait. And then in the end, they're going to get off the fence. Some of them will, some of them won't. And so it's more a matter for us of trying to anticipate what's coming and trying to lay the bricks now. Like, okay, we know that after the election, there's going to be a portion of people that will say, I'm ready to buy. I've been waiting. Now I'm ready to buy. And then there's others that are going to say, well, that was exactly what I thought. And that's why I'm not going to buy. It doesn't matter. People still buy homes, right? They get married, they move, their families grow larger, their families grow smaller. And so what we're just trying to do is anticipate what else in the mortgage market is going to change where we want to wrap our arms around our team and have them feel like this was the choice for them. So a big piece for us is, you know, again, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but the personal, personal development as well. So it's not just a job. Mm -hmm. This is we're giving you skills that help you across the board. So what, <clears throat> what type of opportunities do they have from that personal development standpoint? Because you mentioned in the beginning, you start with the motivators. And so some people are motivated by gaining the knowledge. Some people want to lead a team. Some people want to uh, create these really nice environments. So everybody has kind of a different direction of why they're, why they're excited to come to work every day. So what are some of those opportunities that you guys provide? Well, we started off and did a, a soft skills training with the entire operations team, right? So I should probably clarify and say when we have 75 people, that's on my side of the house. There's a sales organization as well that's probably equal or slightly larger. So we did this um, soft skills training. And then as part of that, what we also did is work with our teams to understand like where, where are you wanting to go? We're building more departments pretty much monthly, <laughs> you know? So it's like the thought of, okay, if you are looking to move into this arena, what are the things today as we're building them that we need to start building your core knowledge for and a little bit of his special projects. There are a lot of special projects. So <laughs> when it's, it's every day, it's like, Hey, I have another special project. It, you know, is anyone special projected out today, but really spreading the special projects out because I think we've done this. Uh, and I literally, my team and I were just talking, you always know who your A players are. You know who your go-to people are. How do you start leveraging more of your next level players that have potential to be a and 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 when you know when yeah. do you do those things? Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you also have those people that really just thrive on routine work? And it's like, okay, how do you make sure you have those people where they're just keeping keeping on doing the things that they love to do, and then the ones that want the special projects or the ones that love to troubleshoot? Yeah, I think it's always important too, right? The only way to grow in an organization is not necessarily to go up, right? Are there lateral moves and you know spreading out their competencies or starting to mentor others? without necessarily taking on that management or that leadership role. Um, not everybody wants that. And that's okay, right? It's okay to know what you want and what you don't want. And you can still have growth within an organization. It's funny that, that you mentioned that. When I was a fairly young leader, I assumed that everyone else also wanted to climb the chain. Right? Mm -hmm. That's That was my goal. I assumed that everyone wanted to. And I had someone that was incredibly 
talented as a closer, for example. And she was really good at it. And one day I approached her, I said, I really need a closing manager. And I think you're going to be phenomenal at this. And she looked at me with deer in the headlights looks like, (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, I I think you could be a great closing manager. And she's like, I don't want to be a manager. (laughs) So I think for me, that was kind of one of those moments in time about learning, all right, maybe not everyone is motivated to grow up. So when you mentioned lateral Mm -hmm. moves, you know, that has been a really big piece for us. We definitely um, are building departments and it's, it's saying, hey, who has enough of a background in that to be able to move into that department? Maybe they're the cornerstone of the department because of the depth of their experience. Yeah. And for our listeners, there is a very big difference between, you know, lateral growth and dry promotions, right? (laughs) Dry promotions are a buzzword out there right now of, you know, here's a new title and some new responsibility, but no wage increase and, and things like that, that are going in an organization. And so those lateral moves do come with, you know, additional compensation, additional responsibility, uh, maybe additional exposure um, and opportunities, but not necessarily people management responsibility. Right. Um, And so how people can just grow in different ways, but yeah. In my younger self as well, it took me a long time to realize that I had to be okay with people who had a different view of their potential and desires than I had of their potential and desires. And that was because I was so driven. Like, it was very difficult for me to grasp that that's not what they wanted. And one of my my former colleagues and I are talking about working together on a project again and um, have both kind of reset what those priorities are for us. And I told her, I said, my, my biggest concern, so her biggest concern is about the flexibility that she needs. And I said, well, my biggest concern is you and I are going to get in a room and work on a project and we're not going to afford each other the flexibility because we're going to feed off of each other too much. And we both just started laughing because we were coming at it completely caring about the other one and and what the other one needed out of the relationship. But it was, you know, obviously well-intended. So thinking of your younger self, We're going to go back a little further than a younger leader. What would you tell 16-year-old Jen today as far as advice to achieve whatever her dreams and aspirations were for her career? Well, funny story first, and then I'm going to answer that. So funny story first, I I was digging back through. I had an old high school yearbook, was going through it with my kids, and we were laughing at, you know, pictures. Yeah. Late Late 80s, early 90s. In my senior high school picture, I wore... By the way, I'm wearing a business suit today, right? So I wore a suit jacket as a senior in high school. Uh, Not a surprise, but what I would have probably told myself back then is it's okay to get some things wrong because that is something that I have struggled with is it making a mistake, letting someone down, letting myself down. Those kinds of things actually are what have gotten me where I am today And not always have I been accepting of the mistakes that have been made or being wrong about something. And I I really feel like if I could have just told myself, these are going to happen and it will be okay, I don't know. Maybe things would have been a little easier for me along the way. Yeah, it was interesting. Just this morning I was with a client and they have a a role that was a little, the person struggling in this role. And so they're probably going to bring in a person above the role. And it's like, how do I tell this person that this is a good thing for them as opposed to a bad thing? And that was where I was like, okay, think back through your career. Where did that happen to you? Because it happens to all of us at some level or another, and it's hard to take. But if you can kind of like show that you grew from something like that and that this is really an opportunity, not a threat for this person, because we're bringing in this person, they describe this person as a a potential unicorn. It's like you have this opportunity to learn from this person and then think about a year from now where you'll be versus you keep banging your head against the same wall for the next 12 months. What's that going to do to you too? I love that you said you have the potential to learn from mm-hmm. this person, right? Because I do think that in particular as as younger leaders, that is one of the things like we, we think we want to learn, but we don't recognize all of the opportunities mm-hmm. to do that. And, and p- partly because maybe we feel threatened. Maybe mm-hmm. we feel insecure. Yeah. Maybe it's like, well, this person's, you know, I'm never going to have a chance to move up if yeah. they're there. And so I do think that's one of the things that's the most important is to take those opportunities and say, hey, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn everything I can learn because there will be some other opportunity that is going to come mm-hmm. available for me. I had a manager once, and again, I, I have everything I've learned about leadership has been through the managers I've loved and not loved. So I had a leader once that said, I'm here to teach you everything I know, because if I don't do that, then when there's an opportunity for me to grow, I won't be able to move up. I won't be able to move into that role. And so that was very eye-opening for me. 
to mm-hmm. say, I actually need to be a sharer of my knowledge and not a hoarder of my knowledge. That will help me move into the next role I need to be available for. Yeah. Teach and delegate your way out of a job. Right. And it's because that's the only way you're going to have ready-made successors who are, you know, able to sit there and, and also like never being the smartest person in the room. Right. Like how, A, how boring of a room is that? So like you really, you want to have people who are around you who are smarter where if somebody from the outside walks in, they shouldn't be able to tell who the leader is. Right. Because everybody's collaborating, everybody's challenging, having productive conflict, you know, and sitting around the room and not just shaking their head at what one person says. Right. Right. (laughs) (laughs) all right well i appreciate you being with us today and um being on the confidence curve with us i think that our listeners are definitely going to gain a ton of insights if they want to follow up with you and connect um how would they do so i love that and no pun right try point connect (laughs) actually i am on linkedin and so i would love i am a big connector i would love to be connected on linkedin you know we are perpetually hiring right we are a growing organization we have a lot of opportunities Um, you know, you can visit our tripointhomes.com website, which is where our careers are posted. Um, But definitely the LinkedIn is going to be the the best place. And I think that you guys will have some access. Yeah. Yeah, When we share everything out, we'll definitely make sure to tag you in that so that people can connect with you. And I can definitely vouch Jen is good at connecting people. If uh, she, anyone in her network that you need a referral to or anything like that, she is fabulous at following up with that. Well, Rick and I, Jen, we thank you for being here today. Thank you to all of our listeners for joining the Confidence Curve. Thanks for tuning in to The Confidence Curve. We hope today's episode left you inspired and ready to embrace your journey confidently. Remember, whether you're leading a team, growing your business, or pursuing personal growth, each step forward builds your curve. If you enjoyed today's conversation, don't forget to subscribe, share, and leave us a review. For more insights and resources, visit us at apexgts.com. Until next time, keep climbing the curve.